Hello, I'm Deontay Kerr, host of Turn Up the Volume Podcast. Today's episode is going to be dedicated to Teddy Brown, Rhonda Pettit, and Benicia Brown. These three are the children of James Brown, the godfather of soul, who are no longer here with us. May they rest well in peace. Well, how are you? I'm doing well. Let me tell you, it is a pleasure to meet you. Like, I have been following you and your family for years. I see... Oh. I see y'all, you know, on Instagram, you, your sister, Yama, Dr. Brown. Like, I just love y'all. I'm going to just say that flat off the back. I just love y'all. I really do. I really do. Well, and thank you. you. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for taking the invitation to come. Um, I have been a huge fan of your dad's. I grew up on your dad's music. And um, it's just phenomenal to, to be able to have you on to talk about him, talk about his legacy. And it means a lot to me personally. It just does mean a lot to me so much. I mean, like I even read, I have three boys. They're seven, eight, and nine, and you know, I've they've had their own James Brown experience, and so knowing about who he is and stuff like that, like they love the music, and uh, it's just a joy just to see you guys still carrying out his legacy. So just thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, and it's a joy to hear that you're teaching your children. Oh, so you know yeah. his 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 uh, music and mm -hmm. um, his impact will continue to grow when we can t continue to uh, uh, put those seeds in the yeah. young ones. So God yeah. bless you and thank you. Listen, my my grandparents. Uh, you know, my mom worked in, at night, so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And my grandfather, you know, he did a lot of James Brown dancing, him and all of his brothers. And so they are always a life of the party. And uh, anytime James Brown came on, they were sliding and gliding across the floor and doing all kind of stuff. And so they exposed me to James Brown. Like, they, my, my family is James Brown lovers. All of my grandfather's brothers, all of them. Like, when they were younger, they would do the splits and all that other kind of stuff and have the pompadour hairstyles and stuff. And, and you know, they, they would just, they were out of control. So, <laughs> so anytime there's a family function in James Brown. in a good way. Out of in a good way. In a good way. And so anytime, even to this day, anytime there's a family function, it is just, you just know my grandfather, one of his brothers are going to do something crazy. And then they're, now they're in their 70s, late 70s. So, uh, you know, it's just a pleasure. Don't let it. Oh, no. Oh, no. They still, they still got win. I'm sure, I'm sure they can still do the James Brown. Oh, trust me, trust me. But look, so also, oh, so we we get carried away. So let me play this and let me play this theme song, and then we gonna hop right into it, okay? Yep. Welcome back. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are watching this uh, podcast, this show, I am Deontay Carroll, Reverend Carroll, host of Turn of the Volume Podcast. I'm excited to be here with you all with another episode. I'm excited, man. I have a lot of adrenaline. I'm never nervous when I come on my own show, but I'm just nervous today because this means a lot to me to do this show. Um, and so anybody who knows me knows that I have been a James Brown fan. And my grandparents brought me up on James Brown. My family loves James Brown. And James Brown is just so in instrumental and influential in our society from his music and all that he's done, the, the marks that he's left in his, in, on the earth before his passing. And uh, I'm excited because tonight I have a very special guest that's going to talk all things James Brown with me tonight or this morning, wherever you're watching, whatever time you're watching. Uh, none other than his very own daughter, Mrs. Deanna Brown Thomas. How you doing? Hello, I feel good. Ah, you know what? Listen, hold up. Uh, you know, I, I wore this just for you. I had, I had this shirt 
I had this shirt since your dad passed back in 2006, and they were selling them in the mall. And I, this is the okay. first time I've ever worn this shirt, and so this is very special that I'm actually wearing this for this occasion. So, I, so listen, you know, I, you know, I got love for y'all. If I'm gonna break out the James Brown shirt that I said I would never wear, okay. <laughs> That's all. That's all good. Yeah. But listen, so I, a lot of people want to know, I know I want to know, what is it like to be the daughter of James Brown? And and not even just that, what was a typical day like? And first, welcome. How are you doing first? Let me ask you that. How are you doing first? All is well. Thank you so very much for having me. And, um, you know, I was really uh, impressed when I saw you uh, in the middle of the pews there. Give a word. I was like, oh, oh okay. This this ain't just no regular brother giving up a regular podcast. He, no, he, he is ordained. I love yeah. it. God bless. Thank um, you. God bless. So uh, yeah, I, I I am one of the daughters of the Godfather, so Mr. James Brown, and I um, was uh, actually born in New York when okay. uh, Dad uh, lived in uh, Queens in St. Albans. We lived on Linden Boulevard. And we didn't stay there long, um, moved back down south. Um, my mother wanted to raise all her children down south, so we came back to where Dad was born mm-hmm. um, in South Carolina. And we actually lived in Georgia and then moved over to South Carolina. But um, so I was born in New York and Queens and then just raised up down here and um, traveled with my dad all over the world after I went to School, you know, got my degree and went to radio school, learned how to wow. got my FCC license to do radio and everything. And then um, I uh, traveled around the world with dad as vice president of the James Brown Enterprises, uh, learning uh, the business from the best, you know, in the business. Um, wow. But I had, to, I had some jobs now. It wasn't, I wasn't just out there chilling with dad. And I wasn't working, okay? Cause my dad don't flow like that. You know, wow. You don't ride off of him. You got to work. And uh, he will reward you, but you're going to do something for him. And so I had to roll his hair. Really? And I had to make sure he had everything together before he got ready to go off to his meeting or whatever the case may be, off to the venue. Um, and, mm. and when I got to the venue, I had to make sure his hair was right. I had to sit in on meetings, take notes, and, mm. and things like that. So uh, my father was very strict. I can tell you that education was very important because he didn't get that opportunity to uh, to go to college, to go to high school. He went right. as far as seventh grade because of my grandparents being so poor because of insufficient clothing. He didn't have mm-hmm. the uh, correct clothing to to go to school in. So he didn't get to go even to music school. To wow. learn how to read music. That's a gift that God gave him. So, you know, he's sitting there and he's directing people who went to school mm. to learn how to read music. And this man does not read music um, because he, does, he did not go to, to school for that. But mm. he could put some, some, some bad hits together that we still jamming out off of, you know? Can't so even count them. Uh, 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 still now. And yeah, yeah it, it's. It's amazing how my father went as far as the seventh grade, and here we are, 15 mm. years after his death, still talking about what an impact he was and still is, because he is still the most sampled artist to this day. And we're well, talking about uh, a, a man who came out of segregated South, yeah. who didn't get to, to, to get educated, you know, uh, uh, like a lot of people, he did not go to music school, but yet mm. he is still impacting music genres all over the world. People who can't even speak English love them some James Brown, and he's still the most sampled artist. You know, God, yeah. God, say, if he was here and they say, Mr. Brown, how and why and all of that, I've heard him say it so many times, same answer, it was God. Wow. Now, let me ask you this, because you talked about growing up. At what point did you realize that your father was famous and meant a lot to a lot of people? Like, did you know, you know, in your infancy or did it take you some time? Like, at what point did you realize your father was big? Yes, Dante, it took me some time. I'm here to tell you. Because I just knew daddy is daddy. 
You know what I'm saying? It wasn't no thing where I had to. I, I didn't know all of that. I mm-hmm. knew it, but I didn't. I wasn't a fan. I, I was just. He was just daddy. So to see him with the rollers in his hair, having cornflakes in the morning, on the phone, <laughs> all over the world. You know, oh, and he sliced up some bananas in them in them cornflakes too. Tried it, he had it real good. Good for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the country breakfast he would always want. Uh, 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 a lady who raised me to make, uh, 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 oh, my mom, all these, you know, country, uh, bacon with some turnip greens, mm-hmm. some cornbread, and I, this is, this is early in the day, but he was diabetic, so he had to change all of that. Wow. And get it right, you know, but, um, it, it, it's just amazing to see him do this, you know, and he, he did it while getting his hair done. Wow. What did he say? Baby girl, pass me the milk. <laughs> there it is. Look, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't need no microphone then. He, he was just straight in the house. Wow. Go get this one, Deanna. <laughs> so listen. So, so to be honest with you, uh-huh. you know, my father came up so different. Yeah. People would think that Everything was handed to me. Of course, I'm born in the royalty. Yes, you're right. Yeah. But my dad was serious about making sure that I understood mm-hmm. the um, the what the morals and values of what it was to get up, yeah. go to work, and make something out of yourself. Don't just ride on the fat of who I was. When I was a young child, one of my, my chore was to water the grass. Now, Jane wow. Brown was certainly afford an irrigation system yeah. however i was the irrigation system every week i had to go out there and i had to water the grass and it was only to teach me to be responsible i got three dollars okay mm-hmm. three dollars but that was what i was supposed to do and i didn't get no money until i finished everything that i was supposed to do so it was all about teaching responsibility mm-hmm. and what it means to get up, go to work, do mm. the job, completely do the job, yeah. then get paid. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And to, to hear that, because a lot, of, a lot of people don't know that about your dad in terms of how he raised you and how he brought you up, how he taught you to have good work ethic. And that is phenomenal. And I think that a lot of parents today, young parents, we should take those those morals and those belief systems and raise our own children to make sure that they too can contribute to society. Um, but listen, you I want to... what about yeah. those old school chores that we yeah. used to have to do? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Go back to those old school chores and, 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 and began to... Because that's one of the things that are not that's not taught in the school. Finance. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. how to match money. You don't yeah. learn that until you go into finance later on. You know later what I'm on. saying? And why not learn that, you know, in, 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 in school so that when you become grown, you can, you'll, you'll know the basics of, 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 of handling money. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about Augusta for a minute because your dad loved Georgia. He loved Augusta. Tell us more about his love for Augusta because, you know, some people, um, they grow, they, they get big, they move away from home, they never come back. But your dad... He still lived in Augusta, right? Up until he passed, yes, right? Yes. Uh, well, it wasn't actually Augusta. He lived in South Carolina. Okay. He lived in Aiken County, right across the bridge from Augusta, Georgia. He was born in Bonwell South, mm-hmm. uh, County, um, Snelling, South Carolina. But yeah, um, he, well, now, let me say this. He did have a home in New York because that's where I was born. Okay. Right. In St. Albans on Linden Boulevard. So we lived there. And then in the early 70s, uh, my mom wanted to move back down south and raise children down down south. So mm-hmm. we moved this way, back down south. And um, we stayed here. And when my mom and dad separated, we stayed here. But we did live in New York, like I said, for, for some time. He did live in New York for, you know, a, a, a spell. But um, mm-hmm. once he moved back down this way, that's where he wanted to stay. Uh, one of his late his late wife, um, uh, Miss uh, uh, Adrian, mm-hmm. she wanted to. She tried to get him to think about moving to Arizona because she liked it out there. 
he was like, no, he 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 was happy to travel wow. the world to go perform for kings and queens and prime ministers all over the world, but to come right back here to this to the south where yeah. he was from, where he felt comfortable and familiar. My dad's home, the way that it, if you go on IG, there's a, um, uh, I have a uh, uh, little small little tour that I did mm-hmm. with the CBS affiliate here in the Augusta area and went in and showed a little bit of my dad, dad's home. And mm-hmm. you'll see when you go in the gate, when you watch going in the gate, that it's yeah. a long driveway. So he's way off the, the, the road and way back into the woods, you know, his own little private we called it the plantation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we was down south, but you know, he is lived that it, a right? Simple, huh? Is that it? He lived a very yeah, yes. Yeah. He lived a very simple. When he was home, he was just quiet. That's to watch beautiful, westerns. by the way. He loved, yes, he loved watching westerns. So it, it was a quiet wow. atmosphere when he was home. Um, he renovated the house uh, back in uh, two thousand. It didn't look like that when when my dad first bought it from my uh, my mom because that was the house that she picked out. Mm -hmm. Um, But he renovated it and that's what it looked like when he passed away. Wow. And that's a beautiful home, by the way. And I can understand because my grandfather watched Westerns too. So I know what it feels like to go in the living room and to see one <laughs> your parents or grandparents watching the western <laughs> so that's amazing i i, I want to ask you because when your dad was home we hear stories that he gave back to people and you know he would give money to people on the street you know um and and if research serves me correct if you could tell me more about this is it true your dad had his own food stamps yes he did wow what he was trying to get black people to understand is that we could have our own economics. That's crazy. You know, we could do our own banking and we could do that ourselves. He had in Macon, Georgia, wow. this uh, place called the Glo- Golden Platter. It was a restaurant but you could also grocery shop. Okay? Stop it. So he was way ahead of your Walmarts. Right? Where you could go in and grab something to eat and do shopping as well. Okay, so he was way ahead of that in those days. And that was in Macon, Georgia. So, you know, that, yeah, he, he, and again, again, this is still a man with only a seventh grade education. A black man with his own food stamps. Like, who, who does that? Who's ever done James Brown? James Brown has done it. That, that is just phenomenal. That's just to hear and, that. And imagine the economic value within the community that you create. Yeah. By by doing that, you know, yeah. instead of being a part of a system that yeah. you ain't gonna never be able to uh, 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 get better. You know what I mean? It's not designed for you to grow, get better, and get out. It's designed to keep you in. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, if there's a lesson to be learned from your dad, it's that when you do get big and famous, when the Lord does bless you with wealth and uh, finances overflow, don't be afraid or ashamed or forget to give back to people, you know, pass it forward. Or, or in my case, what I would say, pass it back because there's somebody coming behind you that needs it. That need, you know, uh, as your dad would say, don't don't give me a handout, give me a way out, you know. And sometimes people are looking for that way out, you know. And I think that is phenomenal, and it's a true yeah. testament to to his song. What he say, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door, I get it myself, you know. It, but you know, sometimes it, even even in that, sometimes it's just putting it in the cabinet so that when somebody does open the door, there's a resource there for somebody to have and and to and to do something you know, bigger and better than themselves, you know, it's just phenomenal. And I, he was that's ahead of his time. Way, that's the way that that mm-hmm. seed grows is to continue to, to plant that seed into people, mm-hmm. you know, into another human being. And, um, you know, once you give that human being that opportunity yeah. to do something uh, with that God given talent, mm-hmm. then you become part of the blessing. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Listen, uh, just recently, we lost uh, Mr. Danny Ray, Kate Man. Um, 
And a lot of people don't realize that Mr. Danny Ray was a very pivotal part of of the show. What was the relationship like with your dad behind the scenes with Mr. Danny Ray? They were the best of friends. Wow. Dad was there for Uncle Danny. I call him Uncle Danny. Um, he was there for Uncle Danny, and Uncle Danny was there for him from day mm. one. You're talking about a, a friendship, a brother friendship for well over 50 years. And there's, there's everybody, I'm going to say this, everybody. <laughs> need them a Danny Ray in their life. Yeah. Okay. That is that's 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 mm. that that's that Barnabas. They they right there. They, ain't nobody gonna do nobody wrong. We're gonna look out for one another. You know what I'm saying? That's true. And my my brother's people, mm-hmm. that's the type of relationship that they had. Listen, I when, when your dad passed, y'all gave him a, a memorial service at the James Brown Arena. I was young then. I was still in high school. And um, I saw that the, the memorial service, y'all had the music and everything going. You know, people were there. Uh, Boosie Collins was there. But it was that one moment when when Mr. Danny Ray came and put that cape over the casket for the last time. I literally lost it. I was like, if, if there was a moment that was memorable about that whole event, it was that moment there. And you can tell even in that moment, you know how much he loved your dad, and how much you know the serve the ser- helping him, you know, with the show and, and being of service. It it was all genuine. It, it, it was very genuine. He was the he was the the, the, the tone setter, you know, <laughs> for the show. Yeah. Once Uncle Danny came out there and got everybody, he was the, the original hype man. Okay, everybody <laughs> got a hype man now because James Brown started that. Him and Uncle mm. Danny. Understand? He came out there, got everybody all excited because the 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 the, the star is on the way, you know. Yeah. And got everybody all excited and whatnot, all hype and carrying on, and boom, drop it. Here he yeah. comes. And then not only was he the tone setter, he was part of the climax of the show. Mm-hmm. The climax is the best when that when when he came out there with the cake. Boy, yeah. That, that that was. If you talk to anybody that grew up with James Brown, they gonna talk about that that cake. That is Uncle Dan. Yeah, and and it, it, you know when I found out he passed, I was like, oh man, like you know, it, it it was just sad to me. But but may he rest well. We miss him, and I think was he still working with the band too after your dad passed? Yes, he okay. did um, for for a while. Um, he did travel, um, and he you know but once he started to get up in age a little bit, you know. He, uh, he he sat back a little bit, you know, um, but he died of natural causes mm. one year ago, February 2nd um, mm. in 2021. Uh, 20, uh, and it was a it was a real blow to yeah. the whole James Brown family because yeah. you're you, you know, when you're synonymous for a, a something that happens, a, a stamp. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Something that happens and you know it's going to happen and you're a part of that. Everybody remember you, you know, and everybody remembers Uncle Danny being the cake man. I love it. I love it. Listen, Chadwick Boseman played your dad and get on up, right? And as a James Brown fan, when the movie came up, came out, I was watching real close. I said, I wonder, can he really pull this off? And when I tell you that Chadwick Boseman literally played James Brown. It was believable and it, it was just phenomenal. Like how did he prepare for that role? Did he spend time with the family? Was he able to go to the house? Did he have to hit stories? Like how how did that process go for him? All of the above. He did all of the above. He studied uh for well over a year watching different uh watching different footage um and he did visit with us and spend time with us and came down and we took him around and showed him different places showed him different stories and told him different stories he went to the house he even met my mother mm. and uh, got a few inside stories that we couldn't even get <laughs> so um but 
such a humble young man when he wow. came he came with his jeans and t-shirt ready to work ready to learn ready to listen he didn't come with the whole hollywood so you know type of uh fanfare and all of that he wasn't that at all as a matter of fact after he left us he went to rent a car so he could drive up the road which is only about two hours where he's from and go see his parents yeah and his own family. um so just to spend time with him and get to know him was a pleasure he was humble and his artistry will always be remembered that young man um made an impact for only 40 for 43 years on this earth we yeah. love him my family loves him to death and i tell you he yes he played our father i used to tease him and be like you too tall you know, I did see that. I said he was a bit tall in the movie. I said it was. There was a scene. I think it was him and, and the guy that played Bobby Bird. He had the jumpsuit on, and I said, "Man, he looked taller than the microphone." Or something. So I did think he was. He was tall, but he. But nonetheless, he was phenomenal with James Brown. He did a phenomenal job, and and then you had Jill Scott to play your mother, right? Jill Scott was your mother. Yes. Like was she? Yes. Was she, Jill, she's a sweet spirit. And that's mm. my, my my son played will work with them more than I because I wasn't on the set like he was he was on the set every day my son mm. um, Jason um, and he uh, Jill was just oh she her spirit was just so sweet you mm. know Jill is Jill is that girl <laughs> Jilly from Philly that's what they call it right. so but what, was she the first choice to to play your mom Yes yes wonderful that is so wonderful. That, that is so wonderful, and she also did a phenomenal job, and to see her in that light, to, to be in a biopic and playing such a role as the wife of James Brown, that, that is phenomenal. Also, did she was she able to spend time with you all too, or did she just hop right into the role? She just hopped right into the role, really. Wow. Um, she got a chance to meet my mom. It wasn't until after the fact, but they, wow. uh, they became, you know, my mom loved her. And everything, and so they had their own. They got they, they had their they got their own little thing. <laughs> mm. That 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 is crazy, but it's phenomenal though. Um, I can't keep up with how many siblings you have, um, but you have awesome siblings. I think Teddy passed passed away years ago. Um, yes, you had a, you in had a, of a car yeah, accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you had another one. I don't want to mess her name up. I think Loranda. She passed away uh, recently. Yes. And then mm -hmm. a few years ago, and uh, Loranda and Venetia. And it, that's the one who I want to talk about. That sister of yours, Venetia. I first found out about her. I first found out about her um, at the memorial service because I, I remember where I was. Where I was. I was in my room, and I'm watching the sermon, the, the service, and the music is bumping. And then uh, they playing Soul Power, I think. And I said, who is this this woman up here? And she get up there and start dancing and sliding. I said, wait a minute. I said, she moved just like her. And then it wasn't until the end to where Mr. Danny Ray said that that was uh, James Brown's daughter. And I was just dumbfounded. I said, she moves just like James Brown. What was your dad's reaction when he first found out that she could dance like him? Well, I don't know his reaction, but I know later on in life, when he got a little older, he would not let her on stage because he was like, she's going to take the show from me. <laughs> you, ain't, you, ain't, you, ain't, you ain't getting on stage. Like, ah, <laughs> but he was proud of her. Wow. He, that that is just is phenomenal, you know. that and, I, and she did some shows after he passed, right? Where she would. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we did a couple shows with Bootsy, okay. Collins in Cincinnati, and she did some shows here. So, yeah, she did, did a few. She did, and she was just great. You know, none of us could do what she did. <laughs> was she the only one that could dance like that? Yes, the only one. Wow. Wow. Yes, Listen. the only Man, one. <laughs> wait, a, wait a minute, though. You had your own moment with your dad on stage when you were very young. Yeah, but I, I, I was just a baby, and it was cute and all of that good stuff. <laughs> I wasn't out there doing the James Brown like Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that it, it, it was just phenomenal, you know, it, to see her do that and to see her embody that movement and that that rhythm and that groove. It, it was it was just phenomenal. Um, your dad inspired a lot of people, uh, and a lot of people look up to him in terms of how they dress, how they you know perform. 
But I think there's one person that when you think of James Brown and you think of somebody that's like right under James Brown, I think of Michael Jackson. Um, what what was their relationship like? Did they talk all the time? In in you know, you know, I, 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 they didn't talk all the time, but they did keep in touch. And my, my dad loved Michael, and Michael loved dad. They had a genuine love for one another, mm-hmm. and it was a genuine respect for one another as artists. And Michael had a genuine respect for dad, you know, as an older man in this business with experience and wisdom. And he was the one that, hey, he's. Like you said, it on stage at my dad's funeral that when he watched him on TV, that's who he wanted to be like. Um, mm. So it was a genuine friendship. Even during the time when Michael was going through his issues, my father didn't shun him off. He was yeah. still there for him. That is phenomenal. That, and, and I love that. That And I think I saw a, a, a video, uh, the picture where they did the, the, the um, when, when your dad was being honored to BT Awards. There was a, a video that E.T. did, you know, and your dad was like, you can always call me. And it was like, I don't know them personally, but I felt that. I was like, wow, that's just, you know, somebody that you look up to to say, my phone line is always open, you know, to you. And I, and, and, and I say that now because when I look at everything that's going on, you know, where you have people that are committing suicide and, and people feeling alone, especially in COVID, to be able to hear those words that I love you, you call me, like I'm here. Uh, no matter how busy the schedule is, like I'm here to listen to you. I'm here to be here for you because I understand you. I understand that there's some challenges. And so your dad showing that behind the scenes in my eyes, like like I, I, like I said, I saw that. I just kind of was like, man, I, f- I feel that. I'm not even in the room, but I felt it. You know, and it just goes to show how your dad cared about people. Right, because he didn't have to say, "Hey," and and he and Michael turned around and told Mr. Bobby, "Mr. Bobby, <laughs> phone number." <laughs> so, so let me ask you: that moment at the BET Awards, did you know that that Michael was going to show up? Well, you know, behind the scenes, you know, we knew some things, but you know, and you yeah. can't surprise him. Man, that's the thing; it's hard <laughs> to surprise him because if you surprise him and he ain't feeling it, you don't want to be surprised. No, so, goodness. you know, he he kind of knew, but he wasn't sure, but he kind of knew. Wow. You know? But he wasn't and, sure. And, and he listen, knew something was going to happen, but he wasn't quite sure with the range of what it was going to be. What it was he knew be. they was cooking up some kind of surprise, and he, but he didn't know it was actually going to possibly be. Yeah, and listen, watching it over and over again. You know, because like I, I want to watch it over and over again because it's like you see James Brown, you see Michael Jackson on one stage. And, you know, Michael had his own style of dancing, of course, you know, with the pop lock and the moonwalk. But it was just in that one moment, you know, he, he shimmed his back a little bit and then he take that little leg and do the James Brown. And it's like it was nothing but like this is my uh, my head nod to, to the person who who was very influential in getting me started. Like, that moment was just electrifying. And, and, and you know, it's, it's so electrifying to the point to where it... I, I don't know about anybody else, but it just it just touched me to be able to watch it, just to be able to see somebody say, hey, I am grateful for somebody who was here before me and paved the way. That's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there's another person that, that was close to your dad, Mr. Bobby Bird. And we kind of saw their relationship play out a little bit and, and get on up. Yeah. So, yeah, Uncle Bobby, um, they met, of course, um, they met in a detention center. Mm. Uh, young young boys, uh, young, young men, detention center. In, and let me get this together and then I'll talk. Okay. They met um, at a young men's detention center in uh, Rome, Georgia, mm-hmm. and um, Uncle, Uncle um, Bobby was from Tacoa, Georgia, mm-hmm. and they met and they got an instant, you know, liking with one another. They clicked with one another. Their spirits came together, yeah, and truly became friends and um, brothers, and made great, great music together which we still listen to and enjoy today, you know? Mm. It was amazing. Um, And Uncle Bobby passed away nine months 
after that. Mm. And, and so, it, it, it's it's very clear. It sounds like uh, Bobby Bird was very instrumental in your dad's career, at least, especially in the beginning parts, um, in terms of you know your dad's start. Um, how, what was their relationship like towards the end? Were they were they still close? Would they still do shows together? Would they still hang out, see each other? No, you know? um, they did do after Columbine mm-hmm. uh, shooting. Uh, uh, um, Dad was very uh, concerned about the schools, and so they got together and they did a song called "Killing Is Out and School Is In." Uh, it's a funky tune. Wow! And um, they did that, and that was the last thing that they did together. They didn't really tour or anything together. Mm. Uh, yeah, and, and it was also amazing to see him at your dad's uh, his, his memorial service to see them to see him perform and to see him you, you know uh, contribute in that send off. And let me tell you something that is like one of the baddest send offs I have ever seen for a celebrity, for an icon like your dad. Like y'all did a phenomenal job with that, um, a very phenomenal job. Did, I, I, I want to ask you this question too. Your dad, in his 40s and 50s, I mean, was still performing. He was doing splits. He was doing the knee drops. He, I mean, he was just doing a little bit of everything. And, and when I realized his age and certain things and certain videos I would see and in certain, you know, photographs, I would always say, I, listen, I just hit 30, okay? And I have peers in their thirties already complaining about they having back problems and, and, and joint problems. How how did your dad perform at fifty, forty five, still doing his stuff? Like did he ever complain about, you know, pain or was he able to just keep going? Like what how was he able to do this? That is a strength that only God can give. <laughs> he never had any type of um for example, uh Prince had to have hip surgery because of jumping off those platforms with mm-hmm. those high shoes. Um, Dad, he didn't have any situations with any. He 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 sprained his ankle one time, and it wasn't from dancing. Mm-hmm. And and he was in a he was in a wheelchair for a couple days, but and that was later on in life. But for the most part, he didn't have any um, major medical problems. It was just a, a gift from God. It was a blessing from God. That's... He did not have those situations. Uh, don't touch the arthritis here and there, but you know when you can afford to have a uh, masseuse every yeah. day, you can you know yeah. overcome yeah. some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, listen, a couple years ago, my grandmother turned seventy, and we gave her a surprise birthday party. And um, one of the things that that I did that was a gift for her was I did a whole about fifteen minute James Brown set for her. And, and, and one of my favorite videos to watch of James Brown is James Brown on the Saturday Night Live show, uh, when he was on Saturday Night Live. And so I danced to that audio. I mean, mic tricks, everything. Like it was just, and I was winded. I was winded doing that. You know, this is a picture of me doing it. I was very winded. And I was just saying to myself, I said, I don't know how he was able to do this stuff. You know, back to back, day after day, in his forties and fifties, and even in his seventies. You know, you know, before he passed, just where was the energy coming from? Because I was drop dead tired, and I even Again, did a God energy. You know what I mean? <laughs> My dad had a special, unique energy. You know why? Yeah. Why is that? My dad was really a spirit. Mm. He was really a spirit. Mm. And he was here for an appointed time for an appointed reason. His divine assignment was completed. And like Chadwick, or Chadwick like him, although Chadwick didn't get the music the dad had, I mean, 73 is not an old person, really, especially with the energy that he had. Mm-hmm. But his body began to fail because he was through. He mm. had done what God had sent him to this planet to do. Mm. 
And when your father is really a spirit, you know, there's things that is not understandable. Mm. Some things that will be a mystery. Mm. Wow. Wow. What's, what's your most memorable moment with your dad? Oh, wow. Let me tell you, you know, I got a few, but um, probably being out in L.A. with dad one time, he was riding around, just kind of looking around uh, South Central L.A. and just kind of seeing how it was for the people. And we came up across, uh, you know, the street, the sidewalks in L.A. are real wide. We came across this one sidewalk with a lot of different uh, homeless people laid out sleep. Wow. And we stopped the uh, limousine driver and said, hey, listen, I want to get out. Stop. He said, told the limousine driver, stop, stop the car. And he got ready to jump out. And all of the security guards was like, you know, like, what is he doing? And he looked back at me. And he said, yeah, I'm coming in. What you see up? And we walked across the street. And as we were walking across the street, we saw these homeless people starting to rise up. And they got this look on their face like they've seen a ghost. Mm-hmm. You know, walking across the street. Now, you mind you, you homeless and you laid out on the on the sidewalk. And all of a sudden, you see James Brown coming towards you. And so they had this look on their face like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. And so dad began to give out money, $50 bills, $100 bills, whatever. And he told this one young man, he says, take this money and go clean yourself up. You get something to eat, clean yourself up. Do something for yourself. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, what I realized it was not about the money. Mm-hmm. It was the hope that my father was exchanging with this young man. Yeah. And not because he was ever homeless himself, but he was poor enough till he was next would have been homeless. So he understood what it was like to be hungry. Mm-hmm. He understood what it was like, you know, to not yeah. have. And that's why. We continue to do the James Brown turkey giveaway and James Brown toy giveaway every year mm. um, through the James Brown Family Foundation because those are things that matter to my father because he never forgot where he came from and he remembered those days when, mm. he, when he didn't have. So he 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 realized God blessed him. He was going to be a blessing for others. And that's what I learned from my father. Yeah. You have. You born into royalty. You are born into have there are people who uh, who don't have and they're born into that and you can always be some type of help to them yeah. and so that's what i learned from my father and that's that's what i try to do you know i'm not out here trying to you know sing or dance although i do got a little something coming up but anyway that's another story <laughs> <laughs> um, my thing is, has always been about you know the business of it um mm-hmm. because if you don't handle your business, if it was dad has 75, 25 or 75 percent of the business that you do is your contracts, your, your paperwork, the bit the business part of it. 25 percent, the other 25 percent is just the show. And you can apply mm-hmm. that to anything. If you don't have that 75 percent straight and locked down and take care of like it's supposed to be and handle, you can give away 25 percent. That 25 percent is going to be given away, whether it's show, performance, whatever it is. So handle your business, have your stuff together. And I've learned that from my dad. So that's what I kind of stay a lot on, a lot to keep it, you know, the whole, the whole business end of it and, and, and teaching that to our young kids to, you know, don't get slacked on, slack on, on what's important, mm. you know, stay on good foot. Your, your dad spent most of his life in the, you know, most of his adult life, especially in, in the public eye. And so the world saw him and his highs and lows and, you know, there's a lot that's being written about him, articles, opinions, or what have you. But what's what? What are some myths that you want to put to rest about your father that that the, that people may have gotten wrong or misconstrued about your dad? Well, he he was he was a shrewd businessman, mm-hmm. but you gotta understand where he come from. He come from picking mm-hmm. cotton. He come from being hungry. Mm-hmm. He come from a segregated south. He come from dodging uh, 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 lynching. Mm. You and I don't know nothing about that. I don't. We don't know anything about that. We can't. We can't even talk about it because we we have not experienced that. We have not looked that type of life in the face. Mm. So 
you know, when you think about where somebody's come from, and I know some people can't fathom that because they ain't came from that, mm-hmm. and they don't even, and they, and they ain't even nobody in their family or nobody that they know has, but they can't fathom it. When mm-hmm. you come from that, you do everything you can to survive. Mm-hmm. You don't go out here and steal because you are trying to be malicious to someone. You survive. Yeah. And my dad come from a mode of survival. It wasn't mm-hmm. pretty. And he did some things that I'm not proud of, you know, um, there's domestic violence, but mm-hmm. that's what he saw growing up. And he thought it was what you t- what you do, you know, when a woman does something that you don't like. So he saw that in my grandfather. He thought that's what, what you do. Mm-hmm. He learned later, much later, that no, that's not what you do. He lost, a, he lost my mother that way. Um, she she left him. Yeah. And so you, and then you so now you don't just lose your family. You you, you don't just lose your wife and your marriage, but you have lost your daughters and your children and your whole family. Now everybody's yeah. gone. Everything's it, this 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 is different now. So there's things that you know these things that you know you you, you hear about it. You're like, oh my God, he was a woman beater. And just, you know he he, he 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 did drugs and he did this that and the other. You know when you think about where somebody come. From, and what they experience. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always come, always an excuse, mm-hmm. but there's some reasoning behind it. Yeah. And, you know, from where he came from, it was to no fault of his own, uh, what he was born into and what he had to live through yeah. until he became big, you know? And, and then even in the music business, you, <laughs> hard for black artists you know it wasn't easy for black artists Mm -hmm. so um i would i would say that you know there's some things from and i'm not finding i'm not trying to give excuses Mm -hmm. and the things that some of the things that he did that was wrong because you figure once you get grown you know right from wrong yeah um but for some reason some people know right from wrong but I mean, you know, a sin is a sin, you know, ain't no, ain't no, ain't no, ain't, you know, a sin is a sin. If it's wrong, yeah. it's wrong. Yeah. Ain't no such thing as that's a worse a sin than this. No, it was wrong. Yeah. So, you know, um, we uh, sometimes do things that we regret. Mm. And I know that my dad did some things that he regret. Yeah. 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 We have we have Graceland, we have Paisley Park. They even got Bob Ross's house where they where he did the paintings and his live shows. Is there any plans to turn the James Brown home into a museum? Yes, that is something that my father wanted and that is something that we're going to continue to push for. Recently, mm-hmm. uh Primary Wave, a uh marketing uh, uh publishing company purchased the estate. Uh however, we uh, look forward to working with them to do the things that uh, matter to my father. I mean, through the James Brown Foundation, Foundation we do quite a bit um, through uh, James Brown Academy of Music Pupils, teaching students um, how to play music and the James Brown Family Historical Tour and the holiday gift things that we do every year. Um, but as far as his home is concerned, that is something that he wanted and that is something that we look forward to working with the uh, estate. But you do have, is there still uh, some things on display in Augusta, uh, some yes, artifacts at the, Augusta, that. Mm-hmm, at the Augusta Museum of History and also the Lucy Craft Laney Museum. Mm-hmm. There are uh, artifacts. Mm. Wow, I gotta make it to Augusta. So, do you work there? Because listen, I, I I need one of them tours where you can walk me through this stuff and say, Deontay, this is where you had, this is well, where you walk. Well, you have to go to the James Brown Family Foundation website and you mm-hmm. have to book your tour. Yeah. And if you have a special request, you have to do that as well. Yeah, and you let me know where I can do a special request. I can't guarantee you that <laughs> <you have to laughs> <see>. <laughs> I'll put it in there and see what it come up with. I'll put it in there and see what it come up with. But listen, thank you so, so much for, for coming and, and joining today um, and, and being a part of this. This is hands down probably going to be one of my favorite episodes that I've ever done. Uh, on my show thank you so 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 much for taking time out of your schedule to sit and talk with me today and being here and telling us about your uh, dad's legacy 
uh, and you told us about uh, Jamp and some of the things that you're doing um, in terms of continuing out his legacy and the foundation. Uh, tell us, what, tell the people where they can follow you so they can keep up with you. Well, on Instagram, I'm at James Brown Daughter. Mm-hmm. Real easy. I don't make it hard. <laughs> on Twitter, it's at James Brown Girl. Okay. Um, and I'm on Facebook as well. Not as much, but because of so much that we do. And the James Brown Family Foundation is on all platforms. Twitter, well, not all, but Twitter, IG, and Facebook. Uh, the tour, James Brown Family Historical Tour, and the James Brown Academy of Music Business. All on all three, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and IG. And you can find us. And, of course, you can go to our website, jamesbrownfamilyfbn.org. Mm. So, um, and you can check out what we're doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Deanna Brown. Uh, Thomas, Mrs. Deanna Brown Thomas for coming. And listen, shout out to your siblings, uh, your nieces, your nephews. A special shout out to your to one of your one of your nieces who I know uh, pretty well, Sierra. Uh, shout out to her. Uh, shout out to her. Love you, sis. I hope you're doing well. Uh, she's doing some good things down in Texas where she is. Um, but I'm Reverend Deontay Kerr, host of Ton of the Volume Podcast. Thank you, Mrs. Thomas, for coming. And uh, until next time, listen, y'all do me a favor. Hit like, tag, share, and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on YouTube at Deontay Kerr. Where is it at? Follow me on YouTube at Deontay Kerr. Also, follow me on Twitter at Deontay J. Kerr. Um, on Facebook at Deontay J. Kerr Sr. And on Instagram at Deontay Kerr. All one word, no apostrophe. And until next time. Y'all keep that volume turned up. Peace. Be blessed. Thank you, Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Brown Thomas. Be good. Listen, do me a favor. If you like this video, do yourself a favor and hit the subscribe button. Also, tap the bell and turn on all of your notifications to see this and more interviews and more shows from my podcast right here on my YouTube page. So, y'all hit that like button, tag, share, and subscribe. Y'all be good.